Right now, we're going to talk, uh, we've done inflation, and we've got uh, a man called Jonathan. Now, just help me, Jonathan, if I get your name wrong, is it Ailing? That is correct, Rodney. Well, very nice to have you on, Jonathan. We've got a, hope you don't mind, I'm going to take up a bit of your day, because free speech seems to me to be, I don't know, something important and, and, and worth having. Um, I was always told it was worth having. Um, and you are a spokesperson for what is called the Free Speech Union. Am I correct? That is correct. And, and Rodney, I think you might be underselling it there a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure free speech is simply a nice to have. In many ways, it is the foundation on which our democracy and our human rights and our way of life are founded. So I think it's a must have. A must have. Okay, well, we'll get to that. But first of all, if I may be so bold, tell me a little bit about yourself and why free speech is a thing for you. But And then we'll get on to the free speech union and then we'll get on to what's happening to free speech and a bit of the philosophy of that. But tell us a little bit about why you are here and so passionate. Well, I, I would much rather talk about uh, the, the tens of thousands of supporters who are standing up with us for free speech, but just very briefly, uh, I grew up overseas. My parents are Kiwis. I was born in New Zealand, but I lived overseas for many years in, in countries that didn't have the right to free speech and, and mostly uh, post-Soviet, post-communist nations that uh, were really grappling with what what it means now to, to be trying to live in democracy but not have that cultural heritage of being able to engage freely with each other without fear of reprisal for different political or cultural perspectives that we had. So, so I'm I guessing, I'm Dylan, guessing uh, that your parents were aid workers or missionaries? They, they were humanitarian workers, that's right. Yeah, so, so I grew up in Mozambique for the most part. So a country wow. that was devastated by, by the conflict between uh, the, the first world and the second world, between Russia and the US. And, uh, and it, when I came to New Zealand to study so just, university... Just, uh, just st- stop there, Jonathan, because that is a tremendously interesting. Uh, what years were you growing up in Mozambique? My period, I moved there as a, as a wee baby, so I don't remember moving there, but uh, I moved back in 2013. So my parents were there for over 20 years as humanitarian workers in, in the north of Mozambique. Uh, and and that was the area of the country uh, under control for the most part uh, of of uh, the rebel group and a, a group that had was actually backed by the West. The rebels were the ones that were backed by the US and other Western nations to destroy hospitals and bridges and schools and that kind of thing, to destabilize the country that was being supported by Russia. But what emerged from that uh, amongst my peers growing up was a was a real hesitation to speak about politics or religion or anything that could be divisive or could be used against you because it was a country that had been so totally divided that people were afraid more of their neighbours than anyone else. No wonder and you're so, pa- no you know, wonder you're passionate, Jonathan. You've lived this. That's right. And it's not an academic issue to me. I look at the direction we're heading in uh, with regards to free speech in the West in general, not just in New Zealand. And I go, do you not know what happens when we do away with this liberty? And it's not something that is just a nice to have. Without free speech, humanity time and time again resorts to far more destructive forms of expression. And I'm not wanting to be um, salacious through saying that without speech you put people's backs up against the wall and they're going to still fight for their for their way of thinking for their way of life but what do they have left if you've taken their words and they're going to use something um, unfortunately a lot more violent often and of course that's the very thing that we stand against as so, the free speech so, union so violence Jonathan, is the opposite of free speech Jonathan growing up in Mozambique um um you lived with other humanitarian aid workers, sons and daughters? No, no. Uh, frankly, where I grew up, we were some of the only white people in the area. Uh, quite a unique experience. Um, and, uh, and no, we were mostly just surrounded by uh, local leaders and, and, and their families, etc. Wow. But um, no, not, not many other foreign. And when you said you didn't have free speech, was this because of the division in society that um, you might say the wrong thing to the right person and they'd take umbrage? Or was it a state uh, denial of free speech? 
Well, that, that's, a, that's a good question, Rodney. Uh, for the most part, it was actually a cultural thing more than a legal thing. Uh, ostensibly, Mozambique had become uh, a full democracy in the 90s. Uh, with, with the many human rights that come with it, including free speech. And, and uh, that does exist on paper. But in reality, uh, people still lived under a lot of fear for what speaking their mind would really mean. And so in practice, both from government, government workers and, and from uh, the rest of society, that wasn't the case. So it was uh, both a legal and uh, practical thing as well as a cultural thing. Because this is, this is quite significant to me. Because it seems to me here in New Zealand, um, the biggest problem that I feel as though we confront, or me personally, is that I can't speak my mind, not because it's against the law, but because of the consequences sort of socially and culturally. You know, you could lose your job, you could be abused, you could be attacked, and you can just tell a... Uh, a joke that uh, hits a sour note for someone. And That's, that is true. And we, we, we are in a place at the moment in our society where there is increasing um, uh, aversion to the notion of free speech. But unfortunately, that is translating into not only attempts at uh, explicit regulating of speech, uh, like we saw in the hate speech laws last yes. year. But just today, uh, NetSafe and uh, TechNZ have released the online safety and harm, uh, digital harm code, which is a real um, blow to free speech in New Zealand. As, as we woke up and saw that today, we were really disappointed that the code that has been released, which um, binds organizations like Facebook and Twitter and, and TikTok to a, to a set of uh, of standards that uh, takes down a lot of speech. Uh, we, we're seeing it go beyond just a cultural thing like you're talking about there, Rodney, and actually seeing it as a set of regulations, a, a code, and, and what will um, certainly before long be legislation that, that limits people's free expression as well. Uh, yes, no, I understand that, and I want to explore that because I didn't know anything about that until I uh, uh, heard about it this morning and got quite a shock. I want you to explain it to me. First of all, though, tell me about the Free Speech Union. What is it? So the Free Speech Union is an organisation that is supported by uh, almost 80,000 Kiwis now. Wow, uh, we are. You. Re- well, you're large. Re- if I mean, the political parties in total wouldn't add up to that number, I wouldn't think, of members. Well, some yes and some no, but but certainly we've we've gotten a pretty decent following in just the twelve months that we've been around. Yes. And uh, just last week we released our annual report, our first annual report discussing the the different aspects of our work. And so uh, we're not a big team, but we've got we've got a strong we've got strong support from the Kiwi public, and we've got a lot of volunteers that support our work as well. And uh, we we operate across three work streams, and and I help uh, lead kind of th- those three aspects of our work and so the the first is campaign so really we uh we came of age as it were we we got a lot of growth out of the hate speech laws where kiwi stood up against uh the minister of justice's proposals around regulating hate speech and that was the most successful public consultation ever conducted in new zealand so uh Almost 20,000 Kiwis submitted on that, and, and uh, about 80, 85% of the submissions were in opposition to it. So that was uh, why we saw the government kind of back down from those for now, at least. So that's our campaign work. We also work on cases. We are a registered union. We have a right to represent our union members and employment disputes and that kind of thing. So I spend my time traveling the country, meeting with individuals who, like you were saying earlier, whose employers are trying to gag them or, or trying to compel their speech uh, at a certain level. And uh, we, we keep our union, uh, our members up to date on, on the, just the different cases that we're representing. Some of them are just shocking um, examples of uh, abuse of um, employment power to, to try and, and force people to think a certain way or to act a certain way. And, and then finally, we also work on content. And that's, that's the longer term work that we have in mind where we want to actually change the tone of the conversation and go free speech isn't uh, about anyone getting to say anything at any time and often being quite nasty. Free speech is actually one of the greatest tools we have as a peaceful and stable society to disagree and to disagree reasonably and peacefully without trying to chop each other's heads off, which has actually around the world been, been the alternative and been the far more likely alternative that we've pursued in the past. So oh, we well, I'm going to I'm going to reprimand you now. Okay. 
because you said it's, you know, one of the greatest tools. I'm going to say it's the only tool. Touche. That's quite now, right. It, um, it is the bedrock on which many of our other rights spring from there. Absolutely. Now, tell me, um, there's the Free Speech Union in the UK by the wonderful Toby Young. Um, are, are you a spin-off of that or have contact with that? Uh, how, how does it relate to uh, Toby Young's work? Yes, yes. So uh, the Free Speech Union New Zealand initially started as the Free Speech Coalition back in 2018. And uh, for a number of years, for the first three years or so, it was uh, a, a volunteer group picking important but um, limited cases to, to work on to fight for free speech. And then last year, um, our General Secretary uh, approached Toby Young to, to cooperate with them to also take the Free Speech Union uh, mantra. And uh, the Free Speech Union, as a organization we're, we're, we're satellites of each other it's not like right. uh, we work directly one with the other but there's one in scotland now there's also one in canada uh there's one emerging in south africa and so uh around the world uh, particularly the anglosphere the english-speaking world there is a view that free speech is under attack and that there needs to be work to uh to stand up against that so that's what we're about now, um, I'm familiar with uh, Free Speech Union in the UK because um, I follow Toby Young and read what he writes. And, of course, it's amazing, and I'm so proud of you because I was amazed um, at the Free Speech Union um, putting the weight of their membership and organisation and their legal and other expertise behind poor innocents who have said the wrong thing on Facebook or Twitter or literally in the pub and who end up on the receiving end of abuse and job loss. That's right. Which is inconceivable to me that we would have to be in this predicament. Now, you've given us a good a good blow about yourself. I'll tell you about myself, and then we will get into a bit more about free speech because Great. I grew up in a world in the 60s where I was told and believed that um, all New Zealanders and my uncles and, 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 and had gone off and fought World War II so that I would have free speech. And I could say and think what I liked. And I thought that's a very, very good thing. I can't imagine uh, not being in a world uh, where I couldn't say and uh, think what I liked. And then, of course, we had the shadow of communism. Fascism having been beaten, there was communism and there were communist countries. And it was explained and told to me that if you lived in a communist uh, country, you couldn't say what you thought. You couldn't criticise the government. Um, you couldn't say something that you was an opinion or was true because you would be arrested. And we we read the Gulag Archipelago. Uh, we, we we read the, the the terrific novels like 1984 and so on and so forth. And we, we had these dystopian stories of what a world would be like if you had a totalitarian government controlling free speech. I went off to university, I studied science, and I understood clearly that um, free speech, free criticism, open criticism um, was absolutely central uh, to the growth and expansion of knowledge and understanding. It was absolutely uh, the bedrock, as you say, of living in a free society, because if you try and stifle what people say or think, you actually ultimately have to lock them up and inflict pain on them and maybe kill them. And many, That's many right. periods in our history, we have done that uh, without hesitation. And the people doing it believe they're cleansing society and making the world a better place because they're getting rid of bad ideas uh, that have infested bad people. Usually it's been religious. Uh, it has been political. Um, and this has been a, 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 a terrific tyranny that the human spirit ha has had to uh, fight against. And we have understood 
and our four, our recent forebears, uh, uh, our grandfathers and our uncles and our, uh, that fought the war and our mothers and grandmothers who suffered through the war and suffered tremendous loss, they understood that when we were in the 60s and 70s, that one of the prices of free speech was that, you know, um, your kids might grow up not being very nice to you and might say things that you disapprove of or might uh, believe in things that you disapprove of, but they understood that's what it was to live in a free society. They actually had this absolute understanding of being in a free society and it was like that great one, what, who was it that said that? Dwight Eisenhower said, um, you know, we fought the war so you could boo the umpire at the game. You know, <laughs> um, it mightn't be very nice that you boo the umpire, but that's what you're allowed to do because we fought a war so you could behave in this way. And but I, I, never I, I also... Yes, I, I, I want to I want to kind of challenge you on the um, well free speech means that your children might uh, think or say things you dislike. Well, I mean I I I, I only have a young son, but I, I assume that even in countries that uh, don't view free speech very well, their young people probably still disappoint their old people to a certain extent. <laughs> and free speech just highlights the reality of it rather than actually enabling it. And I think that's the key point around free speech. Free speech isn't actually making anyone believe anything they don't already believe. They're just expressing it. And, uh, and this is particularly important for minority groups in New Zealand. And, and one of the, uh, the increases in rhetoric that I'm sure you've observed, Rodney, is the fact that we hear more and more that for the sake of minorities, we need to regulate speech. For the safety of those that might experience discrimination, we need to shut down the majority. But it was Jonathan Rausch from, uh, from the United States, a, 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 a journalist over there who was very involved in the gay marriage debate in America. He said, free speech is not a minority's greatest friend. It is their only friend. And, and I just don't understand the, uh, the, the, the belief that somehow shutting down speech isn't, before too long, I think it will happen quite quickly, actually going to harm the very people it's intended to help. If, uh, if we think shutting down the speech of the majority is going to be problematic, before long, surely those same um, abuses of power will be used against the people that don't have as much power themselves. Yes, and you and I know in, in the confines of this program we can express our views. You and I know that this minority uh, thing um, is a little bit of nonsense because, funny enough, I belong to the smallest minority of them all. Me. What's that? Me. <laughs> right? And, I mean, that's the point, right? I mean, uh, I am a minority of one, and so are you. Yeah. And, you and, know, it was and, interesting. And, uh, and, 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 you know, we ha we, we, we're big into creating groups, you know. There's this group mm, and mm. there's this group and there's this group. And that in of itself is totalitarian. Mm. Um, when, in fact, if you're a freedom lover and an individualist, the greatest minority of them all is the individual. And at the end of the day, it's the individual that thinks... It's the individual that speaks and says stuff. And then we individuals have this wonderful thing, uh, unique in the universe thus far, that we can communicate complex and abstract ideas with each mm. other mm. and grow and learn. And not only can we grow and learn with those of us um, in our immediate neighbourhood, we can communicate long distance, but we can also communicate one way with the past. And so you can read the great works of literature if you live in a free mm. society. And um, this, this, this free speech and the argument about free speech to me, and I've I got to tell you, Jonathan, I'm so pleased to have you on because I n know all the arguments why we need free speech. You know, I just love John Stuart Mill's work on liberty and that beautiful chapter mm, mm. he had. But I've forgotten the argument because it seemed to me 
so self-evident. <laughs> it was one of those things. Everyone agreed, apparently. Yeah, I just thought, you know, I never have to have that argument, thank God. You know, the one thing that they might be mad, dreadful socialist pinko greens, but the one thing they believe in, like me, is free speech. And blow me down, suddenly free speech is under massive assault and extraordinarily from the people who you'd expect to understand and rely on it the most, politicians and journalists. And academics, I think. They're also a key culprit in this. And in fact, I would put academics at the top of that list. We, oh, we're here, here. a big part of our work and, and many of our supporters are aware that, that we believe the antagonism and aggression that is emerging against free speech is stemming primarily from the university. Indeed. And that's where... Good um, point. You're, you're a few years older than me, I think, Rodney. This, and that's where I'll say my generation is, uh, yeah. is a little bit um, un- unsure about this notion around free speech. And, and, and we do need to repeat those arguments. We need to convince a new generation that actually speech is not something to be afraid of. Speech and ideas are very powerful, but actually the way you beat bad ideas is with good ideas. You beat bad speech with good speech rather than trying with force to shut it down. It, that's just the way every abusive dictator has always operated. And I want to I give you one example. I think you'll find the story quite amusing if it wasn't so tragic. Just last week, I was representing uh, a member of ours in an employment dispute, and, and one of the categories, one of the professions that um, are under a lot of pres- uh, pressure right now are medical practitioners, uh, nurses and, and midwives and doctors. And, and I was uh, representing a particular individual who is a mortician and they misgendered a cadaver on their surgical table, but who was clearly anatomically a, a certain gender, and uh, they misgendered them because they, they saw their anatomy and were quickly told that actually this individual identified as a different gender while they were alive and that their speech was insensitive and harmful for misgendering them. Now, I'm not sure exactly who was being harmed in that situation by the cadaver being misgendered. But now this person is being traipsed in front of the HR department. They're very concerned that they might lose their job because they insisted that actually the employer didn't have the right to compel their speech and to force them to refer to an anatomically, uh, an individual of a certain gender as another gender. And at one level, you look at this and you go, this is lunacy. This is absolute idiocy to think that we can control each other's speech in that way. But this, this is the pressure that, that professionals are operating under. And that's why I go, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan, we, I'm we just, need to stand together now. I'm metaphorically um, picking myself off the floor and grabbing my jaw off my desk. We're talking about a mortician in a hospital. Indeed. And they've got a corpse, someone dead in front of them. That's right. And they refer or write on their medical records, it's of the obvious sex that a corpse appears. Did they write it down or just refer to it? What was it on their medical certificate? They, they, They referred to it in speech and apparently... They misgendered the individual. Because this, this person, this person, identified differently. this person, when they were alive, thought that they were a, a gender opposite to what their anatomical features would suggest. That's correct. And so, man, that is that is taking offence to a whole new level, right? The, the, this medical practitioner, this mortician, is now in a fight for their employment. A mortician, are they, like, are they a doctor or are they something else? That, 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 that something. They, they chop up dead bodies. That's as far as I... I, I they they, they uh, do autopsies and that kind of thing. And okay. They work under, uh, under you know, doctors who, who perform the surgeries on dead individuals. And, uh, and so now, and, because they referred to this corpse... My God. I mean, it is funny, weird, horrific, tragic, and nasty Mm. all at once. That captures, Mm. and this happened in New Zealand. This happened in New Zealand not two weeks ago. My God. 
boy, oh boy, oh boy. And so that's why I say if you think that we are going to have a fight at some point in the future over free speech, you're wrong. You're going to show up too late and you're going to realize it's already over. The fight is actually happening today. The, the, the fight is happening as we go into a new election round to say, will we elect leaders that are wanting to silence speech or will we continue to dedicate ourselves to the notion that everyone can have their say? And to me, that's a, that's a very Kiwi way of thinking about it. I will decide what information I agree with or what I don't agree with. I don't need the government to go around telling me what speech is safe for me to know or not safe for me. And unfortunately, I think we see both, you said earlier, politicians, but academics and, and journalists as well that have missed the tragedies of many past countries that have been condemned to, to violence because speech was no longer allowed. Uh, and uh, uh, while Jonathan. the British Union is around... Jonathan, our universities have, and you're quite right to call them out, they have become totalitarian, um, tyrannical institutes that you send young people to at your total peril. Well, just last week I was up at Auckland uh, University of Technology and we've... Uh, serve them with legal papers, we're taking them to the Employment uh, Relations Authority for failing to let us ha hold our union meeting there three months ago. As a registered union, one of the reasons we have uh, registered as a union is because uh, we know that many employers want to try and shut down their employees from speaking and shut down other advocates from coming and, and helping them uh, understand their rights. And so as a union, we have a right to go onto employment premises. And when we tried to go uh, there to AUT in April, uh, we contacted them two months before we were going to hold the meeting. They were very cordial, very accommodating. We set up the room. We, we got our speakers arranged. We publicized. Two days before, two working days before the event was held, we were told that the event had been cancelled, given no reason for it. We were just told that we uh, we hadn't completed all the necessary requirements properly, which was um, rubbish because we had, you know, we had made sure everything was tickety boo. And after after the fact, we, we OIA'd what happened, and it turns out one lecturer was upset that we were coming and we were going to be speaking. We were platforming Daphna Whitmore, who is a gender-critical individual who led Speak Up for Women. And one lecturer had managed to lobby the administration to get this event cancelled. And, to, you know, we would have had 150, 200 people show up to hear from Daphna, and none of them were able to, to hear from her because this individual uh, felt unsafe at the presence of a gender-critical woman coming and speaking. And I go, what is the purpose of the university if we can't hear from someone and then hear the counter and decide for ourselves? Isn't that the whole point of education? But, but like you say, it's become something at our own peril that we will uh, attend to this way of thinking. It's indoctrination. It is. Tell me, um, what's interesting about this assault on free speech is... Um, with the mortician and with AUT, it's not coming from legislation or government policy. Um, they may be interpreting something, but uh, it is... Well, where is it coming from? How, 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 can that, that I, how can I be in fear of my job because I misgendered a corpse that's so obviously one sex um, bio biological, which is all I've got to go on because they're dead. And I, I, I say the obvious thing, how can it be possible that I'm in danger of my life, uh, my job, in a free society? What's well, government? It's not government, it's the hospital. It's a problematic issue, isn't it? No, that that's right. It's, it's and and I'm of the opinion. While it's a, I have a bit of a bob both ways. I do believe that for the most part, culture creates policy rather than policy creating culture. Certainly in a democratic society, Correct. at least. And so what we see with the government's actions is more a response to where society is yes. already at rather than the other way and around. That's and that's why the uni universities that, are so culpable in all of this. That's right. Because they've that's produced right. Absolutely, the, it's, it's bred a generation thinking. of. That's right. We have a generation of intolerant bigots, frankly, those who are not willing to entertain an alternative perspective 
on any, any, any level. And I, I, I'm not saying that speaking from one particular perspective. One of the things we're very proud with, uh, proud of at the Free Speech Union is the fact that we have a very diverse council that, that oversees our work. We have a very diverse membership, which means those from uh, the far left and the far right um, come and sit together and they agree that they should be allowed to speak. On, on our panel last week, we released our annual review and I had a number of individuals join me to discuss it. We had Simon O'Connor at one end of the, the Christian conservative right and Matt McCartan at the other end of the, the workers' rights you know, uh, leftist unionism. And they sat there and agreed with each other for an hour about one thing, and that was how important it is that people be allowed to tell their stories. And so this isn't a left-right political issue. This isn't um, about taking a stand on any one issue as it is. We, we don't take stances on substantive perspectives but what we insist on is that people are allowed to have their say and uh, over the i would say, i've been in new zealand for 10 years now i would say over the past 10 years there has been a drift away from tolerance and it was uh, in many ways communities that in the past have benefited from the right to free speech and benefited from the tolerance of a democratic society and and they abuse that now Yes. And so, uh, you know, there are certain communities that probably don't need to be named that now say there is no debate. We will not allow you to discuss this issue because uh, it is a settled matter and you cannot speak about it anymore. And I would say that is counter to the very foundation of what it means for us to walk together in any sort of, of social cohesion. And that's the irony. The government keeps on talking about social cohesion and, and national unity and that kind of thing. And actually, all their efforts, I see, are making things far, far worse. It's interesting, isn't it, that those old lefties like Matt McCartan and Chris Trotter actually understand it. And um, that's right. they yep. may disagree um, with your point of view, uh, but that they would never ever um, uh, shut you down um, That's right. because 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 of your your view. But there's of course a new left and a um, this uh, totalitarian thinking uh, coming out of the universities, which is there's no such thing as truth. There's no such thing as right and wrong. Um, we all just do what we feel, and if you think you're a chicken, you're a chicken. Um, and we're all in favour of diversity and minorities and all the rest of it. But if you think differently to this, <laughs> you should be put up against a wall and metaphorically shot. So um, we're right. into diversity except for old Christian white men who question partnership in the treaty say. They, they, they cannot have a say. They're dinosaurs that have to be ignored. You'll be pleased to know that I have observed this happening for over 30 years because I used to teach at a university. Mm. And I mm. distinctly remember um, the shift occurring. Um, so I went to university in the 70s and it was really wild. You know, every crazy idea was being debated and discussed and, 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 and so on and so forth. And everyone, this is at Canterbury University, was searching for uh, the truth and debating mm -hmm. what was true. And then when I started lecturing in the late 80s and early 90s, I suddenly realized the students that I had in front of me were relativists. That is to say, there was no such thing as truth to them. And they were just hearing, when Rodney Hyde was lecturing, what Rodney Hyde thought. You know, they weren't learning, mm -hmm. say, economics or ecology. They were just learning, you know, that perspective. And then I was heavily engaged in climate change and then suddenly it became that the science was settled. And of course that immediately uh, raises your heck heckles because you're thinking, no, 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 you can't get away with that. Or the majority of people, and this was, this was in the, you know, 90, 91, 92 business, but then what did for me, and why I left the university system never to return, was suddenly the universities adopted the treaty. And they had, mm. uh, I distinctly remember, spirits. 
you know, we had to invoke spirits because, and and this was all part of it. And I walked, I, 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 I just walked out of the university. I could not believe it. It's and and um, it, that to me, and in, in my little world, that started the deterioration. And here we are, thirty years on um, from that. And I see bright young people whom I know, you know, children of friends of mine who are very bright, very questioning, very open, go off to university and they'll do a very staid uh, degree like engineering where you think they just learn engineering and they come out like programmed zombies if you question climate change, <laughs> the treaty. You just get this diatribe and then if you question them, in a way that you would expect gently in a seminar. God, I used to go along to seminars and students would be reduced to tears because they couldn't defend their position and everyone would thought, you know, work a bit harder for next week. You know, you had to be tough to defend your position and your ideas. These little flowers come out of university and they'll spout some nonsense and you question on it and they just get all hurt and start abusing you. Which is it doesn't bode very well for our future. I don't, I don't see how this can end well. No, tell me. Um, I'm gonna. I, I, I am enjoying you, Jonathan, more than I can say. I'm heartened that the Free Speech Union exists. I'm excited that you've got eighty thousand members. I feel privileged that you're here in our country, having experienced what you've experienced and able to um explain free speech far better than me and far more importantly than me i want you to tell us about netsafe and what's gone on there um but i i would and and tell us how we can join the free speech union and support you in your work i want you to do all that now very good well with regards to the netsafe code netsafe is um, an independent organization that is tasked with uh, providing online safety in New Zealand. And from the outset, I think we can all agree that the internet and online uh, speech can be very problematic. We're not saying, uh, as the Free Speech Union, that all speech is good, that there's no such thing as harmful speech. Of course there is. But we're just saying that uh, regulating it in some sort of authoritarian manner that shuts down conversation is no way to address that harm. At the beginning, or end of last year, a code was released. In the beginning of this year, the Free Speech Union ran a campaign on it saying, actually, what this code is trying to do is make a whole lot of legal speech illegal. It's trying to take a whole lot of things that we're allowed to say in New Zealand that Parliament hasn't decided shouldn't be allowed and actually ban it from our, our browsers, from, from Facebook and, and uh, from Twitter and the likes. And what would be an example? Platforms and, what would be an example? Oh, well, uh, three of the key areas that they're targeting are hate speech, misinformation and disinformation. So an example would be if on your Facebook account, you shared uh, an article or, a, or something that alleged that COVID had actually come from a lab leak in China rather than from eating bats or some other theory, then that would have been considered harmful speech and it probably would have been taken down. Despite the fact that as time goes on and debate continues, that perspective actually becomes very credible. And then it falls out of fashion again. Then they decide that may not be what has happened. That's my point. You, it would be something like that, which free speech and debate benefits, that would be shut down. Another thing would be to claim that co-governance is not good for our country, that it's actually anti-democratic. That would be a sort of speech that would be considered harmful. And so... Uh, equally, it, it, it would include things like uh, the speech that Bethlehem College got in trouble uh, to such an extreme extent for at the beginning of June around defining marriage in a certain way. That would be considered hate speech. And whether you agree on these issues or disagree on these issues, that's entirely beside the point. You're missing the important nature if that's what you're focusing on. What matters is the fact that people are allowed to express themselves, they're allowed to have these perspectives, and we're allowed to have the debate. And so... Uh, Meta, which is the, the new name for Facebook and, and Twitter and TikTok and other big platforms like this, have all gotten together and they've gotten with NetSafe and they've said, we're big enough and powerful enough to actually get to decide what Kiwis have, get to see and get to say. We don't need the government to act regulation on this. We're going to do it ourselves. 
And you may think that's a, uh, uh, an ungenerous interpretation, but this is actually exactly what NetSafe has said. Brent Carey, who is uh, their chief executive, has said today that having this code, which is fully, uh, filling some regulatory gaps, is a good first step to try to address some of these emerging issues, especially around hate speech, misinformation, and dis uh, disinformation. What he is saying is they're making law for all of us without parliament and without any of us getting to have a say. So long live democracy, right? In, in, uh, in February this year, the Free Speech Union coordinated a campaign on this, and 94% of the thousands of submissions that were put in specifically endorsed our submission, saying that unless it's illegal, unless it's incitement to violence or it's defamation or it's slander, people should be allowed to have their say. We may not like it, it may not be nice, but we can turn them off, we can walk away. They, it shouldn't be illegal. And what uh, Brent Carey and his like at NetSafe and, and, uh, and Meta have done is they've said, no, we know better and we will overrule your right to free speech and we will shut down these conversations if we consider them harmful. And the problem with harmful is that the insert whatever definition you want into that for however you're feeling on whatever particular day. It's totally ambiguous. It's so amorphous. It can become whatever we want it to be. So okay. I'm really concerned that NetSafe, which is it's actually a, a, a primarily a taxpayer-funded organisation that Jonathan. is independent of the government, but the ministry... Yeah. Jonathan, um, I want to explore this some more. Uh, would you mind coming back on my show later this week and telling us more about this net safe? Because I'm up let's, against. Let's, let's do that, Rodney. Yeah, but also, before, but I also want to give you time. How does a listener contact and join the Free Speech Union here in New Zealand? What do they do? You just go to www.fsu, so that's free speech union, .fsu .nz forward slash subscribe. And we're regularly in contact with our supporters. We, we put out regular updates. We, we distribute reports and we get information from them. We're going to be doing a lot of work around the local council elections and, and helping uh, rate payers and local voters decide which candidates are really standing for free speech. So we want to enable Kiwis to be active in supporting free speech. So go to www.fsu.nz forward slash subscribe. You can also find us on Facebook, just Free Speech Union. We are a, a blue ticked account there and you can see uh, we, we regularly sponsor online events and, and uh, other discussions to help well, you hear from all Can we just say, Jonathan, system. that you're on Facebook for now? That's correct. Because <laughs> it may not last. Hey, Jonathan, you have filled me with hope uh, and it's so wonderful to speak to you today. I'm so proud to have spoken with you. Uh, I wish you God's strength for the task that you have and your organisation and your membership. And I'm so looking forward to picking up where we left off because it is, as you say, um, the issue of the age. And um, That's right. it's happened without us being aware of it. So uh, thank you so much. We'll talk later this week and I'm so looking forward to it already. Thank you, Rodney. We'll catch you then. Well, wow, what a, a wonderful, I'm going to say young man, because I can say that. Uh, what a, a, an amazing young man uh, to be putting his effort and his time and his knowledge um, into uh, defending free speech for us.